Shalom. Welcome back. Last time we discussed our responsibility as parents, and we left with the thought that we should ask ourselves, when we look at our conversation with our children, do we spend more time criticizing or complimenting? Have we set for ourselves the goal of showing children their strengths, helping them realize their capacity to grow, helping them realize where they can grow? And today we will give an example and then move on to some other ideas. I was once standing next to a parent, a mother, and her child, and she had a three-year-old and a baby in the carriage. And the mother was talking amicably to a neighbor. She said to the neighbor, you know, this three-year-old of mine, he is so good with children. He cares for them and he's so gentle with them. And I could see when that mother said it to the three-year-old, she said it about the three-year-old. She wasn't talking to him. Well, the three-year-old heard it, and suddenly he became even more gentle with the baby. Now, I don't know what the mother was thinking, but I was their neighbor for over a decade. I saw this child time and again being the gentlest child with children. And I have to say, I knew the child before I heard this conversation. And I, I didn't see him to be such a gentle kid. So I once asked the mother, I said to her, was this child really so good with kids when you complimented him that way? So the mother smiled and said to me, no. Actually, I was having a rough time with him. But I knew that he didn't mean any harm, and I knew that he had it within him. So I complimented that, and I made a point of saying it to someone else when he heard it. And then he himself lived up to that strength which he had already had hidden within him. He lived up to that. It wasn't living up to my expectation. It was realizing within himself what strength he had. I was once at a Shabbos table where one of the guests turned to a seven-year-old girl and started asking her questions. And the girl answered very excitedly. And every time she'd answer, the guest would be very impressed. Wow, what a smart daughter you have. This happened once, this happened twice, this happened throughout the Shabbos meal. By the end of the Shabbos meal, the guest left, and I remained a little longer. The girl started talking about what a great guy this guest was. I visited that house again for a Shabbos meal a year later, and much to my surprise, that guest hadn't visited again since I had come. But the girl was still talking about what a great guy he was. Ten years later, the girl was still talking about what a great guy he was. I know this family now for close to two decades. And the girl is still talking about what a great guy this guest was. She's married with her own children today. But the fact that he was able to give her a feeling of self-worth, of appreciation, that's something that remained with her till today. When do we feel best? We feel best when we're with someone who gives us appreciation, someone who gives us a feeling of worth. Let's ask ourselves, do we do that for our children? I once had the good fortune of standing next to a rabbi when his three, four-year-old daughter came home from school. And she brought home a, a, a coloring she had done in school. Now, you know children's drawings, uh, there was an outline, and she colored all around the outline. Now, I was in the middle of having a, a very detailed discussion with him, so I was a little fearful. Maybe he'd turn to her and we'd lose our conversation. So I'm standing there with a little bit of trepidation. He turns to his daughter and says, Chani, we'll make up a name. I don't remember her name. He says, Chani, what a beautiful drawing. Look, I'm going to come inside in five minutes, and I want you to be prepared to show me in that drawing every single thing you drew. I want to understand what color you drew here and what exactly you drew there. Are you going to be ready? I'm coming inside in a few minutes. I want you to be prepared to show me. I want you to explain everything about the drawing to me. The daughter went in happily, and I have no doubt that when he went in, he sat down with her and looked at that drawing and tried to understand from her what every part of the drawing was. It doesn't matter if a child is 3 or 5 or 10 or 15. They need our attention. 
and they need us to treat them seriously. And they need to feel like they have an open ear by us. They need to know that they could turn to us. Now imagine we were having this conversation, and as you and I are talking, I'm doing this. Yeah, I'm with you. Sure, I'm with you. I just, you know, I'm, I'm answering the text message, but I'm with you. You ever have these conversations where during the conversation, they're answering a call waiting, they're answering an SMS, they're looking at their iPhone, their iPad. Think about it. What's the greatest investment you're making in life? Ah, you may think it's the stock market, but we discussed last time, it's your children. We have to shut the phone, sit with our children, and be with them. In order to accomplish the things we're discussing, we have to be able to give them the feeling that they're important. They have to be important by us, but that's not enough. They have to feel like they're important by us. If we want to give them that feeling, we better shut our cell phones when we pick up our kids from gun. When we pick up our kids from the nursery, from daycare, when we pick up our kids from school, when the kid comes home from school. So I know it's very interesting to check how your stocks were doing to today, to check the news. Fine. But not now. Because what are our goals in life? One of our major goals should be to bring up our kids correctly. And in order to do that, it requires time and attention and care. When do you feel best? When you feel appreciated. Now, there's a balance that we have to maintain within a home. On the one end, the child has to feel loved, and we will expand on this idea what that means. The child needs to feel secure. The child needs to get positive reinforcement. And at the same time, there are certain responsibilities that we as parents have that we also have to meet and that we alone will meet. And if we don't, no one else will. And let's take an example from the Tanakh. The Tanakh tells us a, a fascinating story. We have David the Melech, King David. And David the Melech had many children. Now, towards the end of his reign, one of his children, Avshalom, led a rebellion against him. David the Melech had to put up with three rebellions. Avshalom, Adonia, and another rebellion. Maybe we'll still discuss that one. Now the Navi describes a mistake in David's chinuch. It says that when David brought him up, velo atzavo, aviv miyamav lemo, madua kacha asita. The Navi describes that when David encountered the last rebellion of Adonia, so the Navi says. He made a mistake in bringing up Adonia. So again, we have the rebellion of Avshalom, and then we have the final rebellion of Adonia. And the Navi says David repeated a mistake with Adonia, the way he did with Avshalom. The Navi says, Velo atzavo aviv miyamav. His father never hurt him by asking him, Madua kacha asita. Why'd you do that? Now that's a pasuk that always perplexed me because the Navi describes that David failed on a point of chinuch. What was that point? He didn't ask him after the fact, why did you do that? So what bothered me as a child reading this pasuk is why is it David's job to come to him after the fact and ask him, why did you do that? Had the Navi told me he didn't forewarn him, you know, this is wrong, I would have understood. But that's not what the Navi says. The Navi says he should have stopped him after the fact and asked, why did you do that? And I only understood this after the following story. I had a group of students over at my house, uh, students from many different continents. Uh, these were students who were coming, looking into Judaism. Uh, they, they were curious to see what's out there. And I was asked to host them for a class. I never met them before, and I, I most of them I never met again. And just before they came, uh, someone came by my house with a donation for a certain cause I was collecting for. So I received two or 3,000 shekel in my hands. And as I'm standing there and the donor leaves, there's a knock on the door and all the guys are standing at the door. So I'm standing with 2,000 shekel in my hand and I'm not sure what to do with it. So I took it 
and I quickly put it in a drawer in the kitchen, and I went and answered the door. Invited the guys in, sat down, and had a class. In the middle of the class, a few of the gentlemen used the facilities and then went to the kitchen to wash their hands. They all left, and you can guess what happened next. I went to the kitchen drawer, and all the money is gone. Now what? So I called the head of the program, and I said to him, look, here's the story. He said to me, now this might sound like biting criticism, but let's think about it for a second. He said to me, what do you learn from this? So I'm skipping part of the conversation. He began by discussing with me how we could try to get the money back. And after that, before we ended the conversation, he made a point of stopping me and saying to me, what do we learn from this? So I was dumbfounded. I wasn't ready for that. I asked him, what do you say? He said, we learn from this that even if people are knocking on the door, if you have a sum of money by you, you put it in an envelope and you put it away, we're going to try to get that money back, but we have to learn from this. And he was right. And to this day, I have appreciation because he stopped me and pointed out to me what I had done wrong. I would have continued and said to myself, I was pressured. They were knocking on the door. Who would have thought someone would go into the, into the drawer and take out money? But he was right. And I would not have realized how wrong I was. So to this day, I have appreciation to him. By the way, in case you're wondering, it was in a different drawer. I misremembered where I had put it. And after we were trying to figure out what to do with it, I started taking the house apart, and I found it. No one had taken it. But the mistake was still a mistake. And to this day, I'm thankful. So again, we said we have a job as parents to give the children love. But we also have a job as parents to give them guidance. We have a job as parents to stop them and say, wait a second, what do we learn from this? Or stop them and tell them the way the Pasuk says about David. Madua kacha asita. Why did you do that? If a child comes home and tells you, you know, I spat at my teacher, you better ask him, wait a second, why did you do that? Do you think that's right? Part of our role as parents is not only to give love, but also to give direction. And also to stop a child and say, why did you do that? Is that the way you should really be behaving? And maybe to tell him, no, that's not the way you should be behaving. That's not acceptable. And the two are not contradictory. Which leads us to the next point, which we'll develop as Hashem next time. We'll start on it this time. And that is the idea of self-confidence. If we want to balance the love we give with demanding and giving direction, then our children have to have the self-confidence to be able to get direction. When a child has no self-confidence, then any comment you make is destructive to him or her. Think about ourselves. If we take criticism personally, then we're finished. It's hard to look in the mirror. If we stop and we have enough self-confidence, then we can stop, accept it, listen to it, learn from it, and become better people for it. The same is true with a child. So we have a responsibility to balance the love we give and that that love should not be contradictory, but supplementary to what we demand of the child, the guidance we give the child. And in order for those two to work in harmony, the child must have self-confidence. And now we're going to start exploring how these three concepts work together. Self-confidence, love, and demanding of a child. And that, Be'ez Hashem, will be the focus of our next session. So let's review what we discussed today. We discussed the story of the girl who spent decades admiring the person who complimented her. We discussed that we feel best when people compliment us, when people appreciate us, when people see what's good in us. We discussed our responsibility as parents. We discussed the story of the mother and her three-year-old child, the mother who commented to a neighbor, saying, look at how good he is with children. And then the child himself discovered that he really is good with children and became even more sensitive with children. We discussed the story of Avshalom and Adoniyav and Chagit, the responsibility of a parent to ask, why'd you do that? 
the balance between loving and also demanding and giving direction and sometimes, yeah, criticizing. We discussed that the three work, the, the three concepts of love, demanding, and giving self-confidence work hand in hand. When he's given the proper love, he will have the self-confidence necessary to accept the direction and continue growing with it. Thank you very much. Thank you.